Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the topic of remote viewing the afterlife. My guest is Daz Smith, a full-time professional remote viewer. He is also the editor and publisher of Eight Martinis, a magazine of remote viewing. He is the author of a number of books, including Surfing the Psychic Internet, Remote Viewing Dialogues, CRV, Controlled Remote Viewing, and Remote Viewing 911. Daz is based in England. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Daz. It's a real pleasure once again to be with you. Yeah, it's nice to be with you again. And, and thanks for having me back. Well, we've gotten a very positive response to the first video that we did on uh, Ingo Swan's fascinating work, uh, remote viewing the moon and other uh, locations. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to do is uh, link to that video now in case some of our viewers haven't watched it. They, they can, uh, if you don't have a cell phone, you can uh, actually, there's a hot link right above where my finger is and you can watch that video right now, if you like, before we begin our conversation today, which is equally fascinating, remote viewing the afterlife. And I guess to set the stage, we should talk a little bit about the fact that this is one of a series of remote viewing projects you did with Courtney Brown and the Farsight Institute. I think I worked 16 uh, targets over a period of probably eight years with Courtney, and this was uh, Target 14, and we never knew what we were doing. Uh, so literally the only identification I had to go on was this is Target 14, and that's what m myself and the other remote viewers used as our uh, cue in this. And yeah, it was a great project. Uh, we did it in uh, 2015, and we put out the video that you've seen in 2016, because uh, that was stuff Courtney, that was video material Courtney essentially cut out of the uh, the production and it ended up on the cutting room floor but we felt it was so interesting that we uh we thought people would like to see uh someone that actually rv'd someone going through the afterlife kind of experience and to set the stage a little more, Courtney had established the target to which you were blind uh, of the assassination of John F. Kennedy in Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas in November 1963. Uh, the target itself, I think it had two separate targets within the, uh, the encoding of it uh, at Courtney's end. Um, uh, and I think one part was to look at the assassination itself and one part because he wanted to find out who was involved was to get us to try to find out yeah who who the conspirators were if there were if there was a conspiracy uh, and to try to follow them as well so yeah it had a two part two part project it's very interesting, and I know uh, Courtney has put out a number of videos looking at mysterious targets of this sort i I know in our last conversation uh, about Ingo Swan and his work looking at phenomenon going on in outer space. Ingo made a point, and you agreed with him, that if you're not getting feedback so that you can compare your transcript with some physical event, it's not really a full formal remote viewing according to the classical protocol. Yes, yes, that's correct. I mean, we're lucky in this case in that we do, you know, we did the, we did the target blinds. So we didn't know we were looking at the JFK assassination, and we do have quite a lot of feedback material. You know, we have the uh, all the documentation, all the news reports, the Zapruder film, for example. It's just that when uh, or if I report uh, details that aren't in any of those media sources, then it gets a little bit hazy on whether that's uh, valid data or not. But the, the fact of the matter is, and this should be of great interest to our viewers, there were many points in which your descriptions were right on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was, it was probably one of my best RV sessions. And it might be because I've always had a lifelong interest in the uh, Kennedy assassination. So I read several books on it and watched, you know, watched the Oliver Stone film on it as well, which is a, a classic. So I think that that, that helped. 
And yeah, I had some great data points on it. Um, only some things can't be confirmed. Like uh, I did detail shots coming from several different directions, uh, which is, you know, a controversial point at, at this stage. Mm -hmm. But you were able to identify, while blind to the actual target, I want to keep emphasizing that, that uh, you were viewing an individual who was a passenger in a vehicle who had been uh, suddenly uh, attacked and killed. Absolutely, yes. Uh, in, in CRV or remote viewing, the way we do it, we're, we're, uh, we're not allowed to kind of uh, name things. So I don't actually say in the session, uh, this is a person that's being shot. I mentioned that it's a person in a vehicle that's having an event where two sources of movement and energy are moving towards him. You know, I'm trying not to say that these are bullets, but essentially I am describing bullets and an assassination. Yes. So the part that we are going to focus in on now is what you experienced in your remote viewing at the moment of death and shortly thereafter. I have to be honest, it was uh, probably my most life-changing RV session I've done in 24 years. And uh, I go through the RV session in the video, and I, you know, because all this was captured live on video, uh, we didn't really go through this much on paper. But on live on video, I went with the flow of the, uh, the experience I was having, and I felt like it was a person having their death experience. So I thought, well, let's see where this goes. Uh, I, you know, I had no aim behind it at all. It was just pure accident. And uh, yeah, it was a, it really interesting because I knew that the life form at the time of the event was having, you know, because they were going through this uh, this travel event where where he was having an interaction with energy, and I you know I kind of knew it was bullets, but I didn't want to say the word bullets. I uh, I knew that there was some distress there, and I could feel the distress in the uh, the emotional turmoil he was going through all these questions. And then it was it was amazing. It was a process where you like flip a light switch and there was a silence and and um, a mindfulness instantaneously where the panic of all those questions and, you know, what will my wife do or my kids, all that kind of stuff instantly f fell away uh, into this just mo most beautiful sense of mindfulness. Um, from that point on, I, yeah, I, I experienced these very small particles of light form essentially out of nowhere into uh, human, very blurry, but human type forms. And they also interacted in kind of guided, uh, I guess, JFK, uh, how he was going through this, as he was going through this amazing process. Now, in the uh, video, you'd never identified him as JFK, but by the time you had described a passenger in a car, obviously being a, killed, suddenly and unexpectedly. And you also mentioned that you knew this event happened in the past, but that it still is affecting people, that many, many people are emotionally attached to this particular event long after, or at least some period of time after it had happened. It, it, it wouldn't have been too hard to surmise that it might be the Kennedy assassination. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I mean, in my in my mind, you know, because you do start to build up a picture of the target in your own head when you're doing this kind of work. And in my mind, I do remember thinking, well, I know it's a life form in a car. Uh, I felt it was male, so that, um, but sometimes you get male and female wrong. So I didn't I didn't go on that data. But you know, I knew it was a life form in a car going through a, a death event situation that had a great impact on society. Uh, and I can only think of three of those, and you know the. Uh, I think the one that started World War II, the Ferdinand one, uh, JFK one, and maybe even a, a bit of a stretch, the uh, the possible uh, Diana, Prince of Wales kind of crash event kind of thing. So there, I think there was only three scenarios that it, you know that it could possibly be, but because of the the feeling uh, and the drawings I did, the sketch of the vehicle as it went around a certain corner and there were there was a hill, a grassy area, and the energy motions that were coming from different directions. I kind of had more of a feeling, yeah, at that point, it was the JFK kind of assassination. But you never said that, and I guess that's because of your discipline. That's correct, yes. Uh, if, it came, if it came really, really strong in my mind, and I knew it was going to uh, interrupt and, and bring a lot of noise to the RV session, I would have actually objectified that on, on, on the sheet of paper or on the whiteboard. 
Um, but I felt I was just keeping my mind open to it at this stage, and not, and you know I didn't actually you know I didn't actually name anything like bullets or anything like that. So I, I allowed myself to just go with the flow and and, and not be yeah not be influenced too much by it, I don't think. The afterlife experience that you had, uh, how long did it actually last? Well, on camera, it looks like it's probably about five to ten minutes. Yes, so quite in depth. And the interesting thing is that if people get to see the video of this, you know, it's online in several places. Um, it's it's quite emotional for me as well at the same time. Uh, again, it was completely unexpected. I had no plan to do this. And there was no plan in Courtney's uh, targeting of us getting the information for me to go off on essentially a tangent and get this information. Um, and I had no preconceived ideas of, of life after death. I mean, I had trained in the past as in mediumship, um, but because of my training in remote viewing and being able to get any kind of information I want during, using those sources, I have to be honest, at the time of doing this RV session, I was a bit, uh, what's the right word? I didn't really fully believe uh, in the life after death process. Um, but this this experience, you know, and seeing the well feeling and feeling the calmness and and the process that this life went through, um, that definitely changed my mind and weighted it a bit more in the direction of of some kind of life after death existence. And you know, for viewers who haven't seen that video, I will link to it now on uh, YouTube. It's available, and if if you don't have a cell phone, if you're using a regular computer, you can hot link right above where my finger is uh, and watch the video. It was made by Dick Algier and and you and Courtney Brown uh, all together. Uh, it's a fascinating video. But one of the things that intrigues me about this video that you've just explained to me is that when you worked with Courtney on this project, you actually worked on it for months, putting your uh, remote viewing impressions on paper and pen or pencil uh, before you did it in front of the video cameras on uh, and on the whiteboard. So. When you visited the afterlife, did that take place prior to the actual video? No, no. Uh, I'm, I, I'll, I would have to go through the RV session, bearing in mind it's like seven years ago. But I don't recall my, doing anything on paper other than maybe recording that I felt like there may be a death involved somewhere at, at the target in general. Uh, I think what happens... The amazing thing with remote viewing, it, what happens is, and, and this is a process I think has only come about the last few years, is that when we do things um, live on the whiteboard, uh, I, I believe it, because we're standing up and we're using our entire body, our fingers, our hands, we're, we're moving around, I think it uh, kind of initiates a kinesthetic process where the whole body gets involved in the RV instead of Norm, normal RV, where normal RV, I would be like, I am now sat at a desk, so half my body's not being used. But because you're do, you're you're in full flow in front of a whiteboard and your whole body's being used, I feel that that dramatically increased the uh, my capability and my sensitivities that I was going through the process, and it allowed me to capture that that more more much more detail in in real time as it was occurring. It's a funny word, remote viewing. It certainly implies that it's mostly based on visual sensitivity, but obviously your awareness of a non-physical reality in, uh, and also your awareness that a death was involved it must have been some other form of knowing, not strictly visual. Yes, it's uh, for me, for myself, it's hardly ever visual. Um, yeah, so remote viewing is a terrible word for the experience, really. I would say for me, uh, two to three percent of it is visual. And if it is visual in my head, it literally is a black and white image that's there for a fleeting second. A bit like when you look at something and then you look away and you get an after image. That's that's how the visualization is. So where this information comes from, I still do not know. It, for me personally, it's uh, it's more of everything is just an internal subtle feeling um that i just have to uh i have to transcribe from feeling into into words and pictures as best i can
And of course, when you're describing something taking place, I, I'll call it in hyperspace, but not in our normal three-dimensional reality, it's very hard to put into words of any kind. It is, yes, yes. Especially this one with the uh, with the uh, the death process, because you know, I, I felt the um the, the calmness and I can't even I can't even put into words even now, even now it lingers in my own head the calmness uh, at this state that, that I felt in RV. And it was literally so much noise and so much emotional, almost like screaming from this life form. You could feel it at the state, uh, at the stage of, of death. And then literally like an instant light switch, you know, and it was, the, it's, it's the shock of that noise. And then that, that no noise, uh, and then complete calmness, which, uh, which today uh, pervades me really and it eludes me. It's something that I I probably yearn to get get back to in some in some sense because I've never I've never experienced such calmness like that in my life really. Yeah, and it seemed as if Kennedy, I presume you were viewing Kennedy, also achieved a sort of egoless state where yes, his emotions, his attachments to his present role on the physical plane was still there, but at the same time, he was distant. He was it wasn't didn't have the same grip on him. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. The point of, you know, the event happening on all the uh the uh, motion and energy hitting him and for a split second all that screaming out i could hear his thoughts you know oh my god what about my kids what about my wife why did this happen and then yeah it was with that light switch effect it was, it was like all that was stripped away and it just did not matter anymore and i felt that it, although i was feeling the the mindfulness i you know i i, I i'm I, he must have been going actually going through that transformation process and i felt like stages it felt it's hard to put his line on but it felt like the whole event also transcended time uh, so what would be like a, a minute split second of event for me felt like five to ten minutes as i was going through it um so yeah it it was timeless and transcends time uh, or time slowed down uh, it, was, it was it was very interesting to see after that light switch effect how i would say time didn't exist anymore after after that so it was mindfulness and time didn't exist um yeah and i felt he went through several states of transformation at that at that split second of time and one of those states i suppose is just a question of orienting to this very different reality i would yes i would have thought so i mean i didn't see anything visually it was all feelings for me but yeah because you're going from a physical state where you have everything inputting to you to being uh what i did feel is it, it did feel like a a huge pink openness uh of, of space and it you know and, and it did have it does have some kind of physicality in that it did feel kind of like smoky and misty but that that felt like it felt more like energy uh that was like a mist or or a smokiness yeah but it was everywhere so you and you were part of that everything at the same time it, as i said it was it's very hard for me to put all this into words really I got the impression watching your description of it on the video that the smoky, uh, misty quality was in some sense alive, that figures would sort of emerge from it and they were part of it and they, that these were other beings who had come to greet him. Absolutely, yes. Um, I remember that they weren't there in, in, in like a true form that just came out of nowhere out of the mist. They they kind of coalesced or or uh, transformed or emerged from out of this mistiness as very small, or, yeah, almost like particles of a fizzy kind of particles of light that kind of like sucked inwards and then coalesced into these very loose uh, human human style kind of silhouette forms. And you know what struck me is that. I didn't recall you saying it during the portion of the video where you were describing the remote viewing process, but afterwards, in reflecting on what you had experienced, you suggested that the person, Kennedy, was communicating, I think was the word you used. Yeah, uh, I mean, after he got over it, I think, you know, there was a kind of, as the light switch moment happened, there, I would say a split second of 
what's happening to me, you know, the loss of the ego, the loss of the self in some kind of regard there. And then, yeah, as these forms coalesce uh, or these sparkles coalesced into, into these forms, I felt that he knew who they were instantly. And there was, yeah, there definitely was a communication and a greeting kind of experience, a, a welcoming kind of experience going on there, which uh, I felt that, you know, there was a, a great feeling of love and enjoyment and calmness uh, about, about the whole thing. And it, it, did it go much beyond that? I don't think I followed it any further, to be honest. I think at that stage, you know, not long after there, I think I probably pulled back from it and didn't didn't go any further. As I said, because the whole experience wasn't really part of what the project was about. It was me going off on a tangent, really. And I was a little bit aware that maybe I was describing something that the, uh, that the target person didn't want. So my discipline kind of, I think, pulled me out of it a little bit at that stage. Or maybe even... A bit of fear or reluctance on my part to go in to go any further. Hmm. Well, you mentioned that you had also had training, I suppose, prior to the remote viewing training as a medium. Yes, yes, many years ago, uh, before I yeah before I did remote viewing training. Uh, from the age of, uh, I mean, I started early. I, I was quite lucky in that I grew up in a household where my mother was a psychic clairvoyant medium and she also ran the local spiritualist church so from the age of six on up uh we went to the spiritualist church you know and on a sunday i would i would watch mediums uh you know give talks about people that they were seeing and stuff so i trained there from the age of 16 onwards and i and i did mediumship uh and clairvoyance and channeling and lots of other things um but as i said i kind of stopped doing all that when i found remote viewing because I find that all that kind of stuff was a bit chaotic in that I was a passenger in the process and the process was driving the car. So I had no control. Um, and what I found within remote viewing was that allowed me then to take control and be the, uh, the driver of the car and stop the process when I want to investigate and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I did have training in it. Um, but yeah, I kind of lost my way with the classical techniques and, uh, ended up with remote viewing. So at this point in your life, what is your attitude toward the prospects of survival of consciousness after death? Yeah, I'm still, well, it's hard. I think it changes day to day. Uh, some days I'm absolutely convinced. And when I, when I review the video of my experiences of, of the JFK you know, assassination event, I'm even more convinced um, so I should go back and rewatch it, you know, every uh, on a periodic basis for you to remind myself because I think I forget. Sometimes I'm I'm a bit worried about, you know, can I get the same kind of data through RV? And I'm not so convinced in that now. Um, I think RV is taking me down a different path where it's showing me that there's the, the universe around us is is a lot more conscious than we realise. Um, so yes, I'm I'm still open minded. I'm not I I can't say I'm I'm an absolute 100% convert of life after death. Um but I do believe there's something there happening and it makes it makes sense otherwise everything would be just such a waste really and, and the universe doesn't work like that. Well, it sounds to me like what you're suggesting is that the universe is so complex that our attempts to express it in the English language, a, a phrase like life after death, doesn't really capture the nuances of it. Yeah, that's that's so clear. It is so complex. It's a it's like, a yeah, a multi-layered onion. There's so many different things going on. And, you know, it's. It, the interesting thing about the, the life after death experience that I had is it's uh, it's not that much difference from when we had these experiences when we you know maybe communicate or or go to a U, UFO ET type craft or somewhere off planet or even something else with remote viewing. It seems like everything is interconnected in the universe. You know, love, chi energy, uh, consciousness. Uh, and yeah, we, you know, I, I think we fumble, fumble for words to, to describe what's going on. Um, I do believe though that there's, it seems to indicate to me over and it seems to be growing in my, in my appreciation of this, that there seems to be some kind of, I would have to say conscious, uh, kind of decision-making, 
intelligence behind it all. And I don't want to put a word on it like like God, because I don't know what I believe in that kind of sense. But there does feel like there's a a higher being kind of consciousness that that seems to be driving all this and and uh, helping us through it at some level. Have you made any other efforts to go back with remote viewing and look again at the afterlife? I would love to. Um, the only problem we have as remote viewers is we rely on people setting us the targets to do that because we have to work totally blind. So it's in, you know, it's like one of these big projects that's in a pool that I would absolutely love to do if someone wanted to set it, set it to me as a, as a project, uh, but no one, no one has, has of yet. What about other remote viewers? Uh, I know you're very much in touch with the community of people engaged in this work. Do other people, uh, ha have there been other reports of v remote viewing visits to the afterlife? Not many, to be honest. Uh, I think I've read a few when people have done uh, missing people cases. And, you know, sometimes you're you're looking at a, a person that's deceased. So you get a little bit of crossover event there happening. But I have no in, in the 24 years I've been looking at this. I don't think I've seen any uh, no any proper uh, interested kind of projects to, to really look at this with remote viewing. And I think it's a. It's something they're sorely missed, actually. There's that's, that's something that we, we, we could do if we could uh, get a few people together and, and a good project manager on it. Absolutely. I know Raymond Moody has written a book based on his earlier research on the near-death experience that oftentimes people who are in a deathbed hospital room, for example, at the, at the moment of death, have the experience of just sort of going along into the afterlife, at least the early stages of it, with the departed, spontaneously. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I've been, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have been, well, I say lucky enough to, to have been present at the, uh, the passing of several of my relatives, including my parents. And um, I, yeah, being a sensitive, you know, person, I, uh, uh, I would say that I can definitely feel that there's there is some kind of level of contentment that they reach at a stage, you know, a few moments before there is this kind of passing event. And it does feel like uh, there is an energy transfer of some kind. Um, I can't say I've physically seen it or anything. It just, you know, I just like like we're doing the remote viewing. I just feel or sense a, an energy transfer with some kind of release, which is is interesting on its own. I think, yeah, maybe maybe that's an area that could also be be looked at by by science. In other words, it would be possible to establish an ongoing remote viewing program that could uh, probe these non physical realms uh, in a rather systematic, precise manner. Absolutely. And I think it would be a fantastic use of the, uh, the tool for of remote viewing. Uh, I, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure we could go uh, further than I went and maybe, yeah, see where it goes from there. Because, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm at a loss now of what, what, what happens after that meeting event of meeting your uh, past friends and family. Uh, the only slight thing we would have would be verifying it would fit with, you know, potential feedback. But I think we have enough anecdotal stories uh, from people that have, have also gone down that route to uh, give us some level of feedback on that to, uh, yeah, give us some an idea. And, and certainly from our previous interview, I know you feel that remote viewing information is best used in conjunction with other sources uh, and not simply you know, all by itself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you always need to use it with other sources of information. I mean, that's why remote viewing was essentially uh, built and established and used by the, uh, you know, the U.S. and the uh, the Russian military units. You know, to tr they had insufficient data and they wanted another source to add to it to uh, to verify that data. It was never really used alone, and I don't think it should be today. I mean, we can slightly rely on track record of a viewer for i for example you know over many years now i've had a data-based uh, accuracy record that people can look back on and say okay he's usually this this accurate so there's no reason why you should be completely off on this target but feedback is m most definitely part part of the uh, equation that you need yeah absolutely now i'd like to go back uh, to our earlier 
interview when we talked about Ingo Swan's visits to the moon and elsewhere using remote viewing. I bring it up because I know that if one digs into the literature on seances and mediumship and also ufology, there seems to be a certain amount of overlap that people report encounters with non-human beings, potentially alien beings, and the departed sometimes occur in, in the same setting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's across the board as well. You know, I, I've worked on many projects with many of the top people in remote viewing. And even when you get a, what I call a newbie or a new person uh, practicing remote viewing, when you get them past a certain level that they can start to handle what I would call mystery or esoteric type targets. If you give them a target like the moon or Mars or something, undoubtedly every single time they, and I don't think we're being influenced by me as a tasker, uh, but every single time, whoever the tasker is, they, they talk about seeing structures and past life forms on, on Mars and the moon. And when we do uh, missing people cases as well, quite often that you know, when we because I've done 250 of these myself for the United States police forces um, when they're deceased then as well as a remote viewer you can you can get information from a from a deceased person so there seems to be some very strange continuation of, of, of this energy and information maybe it's the same thing maybe the energy is information or the information is energy and it seems to be everywhere you know, within us. I don't think I'm going anywhere. You see, I don't think I go to Mars or go to a dead person to get information. I think that information is already within me. I'm just tapping into it. Well, that makes uh, perfect sense when one thinks of uh, consciousness as being the ground of being itself, that who we are is much, much larger than just this body. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And I think some of the Eastern philosophies have it right as well. Uh, I'm lucky enough in my past, and not so much now because I've been ill the last year, to have done quite a lot of martial arts. Uh, and I found that the, when I was practicing Tai Chi and Qigong, that made a real lot of sense to me. And I think that also massively enhanced what I'm capable of doing remote viewing because I felt, even then, I felt the Qi energy that I felt flowing through the ground and flowing through me uh, it felt to be the same creative force that I was getting through remote viewing and just through my normal creative process. And it seems to be the same kind of the same has has the same essence of the kind of energy that I experienced when I saw the pink kind of fluffy cow things that coalesced into forms that JFK conversed with. It's, it all seems to be a continuous flow of uh, energy and information at some level. Daz, I'm really glad that we've connected. This has been a very pleasurable conversation. I hope that you and I can have many more to share with the New Thinking Aloud audience. I know that our previous video was very popular and our viewers are asking me to bring you back often. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, maybe we can talk uh, in the future about some of the remote viewing we're, we're doing at the moment, uh, predicting markets. That's going very well as well, financials. Well, that's a big interest of mine, so I would be very happy to discuss that with you. Great, and it's been an honor chatting to you these two times. Well, thank you so much for being with me, Daz. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. <laughs> ¶¶